Hello everyone, welcome. I am TJ and I'm sitting here with Todd McWilliam Franklin. How are you doing today? Wonderful. Thank you for sitting down with me. My pleasure. I'm so excited. Wait. So you're a woman of sports. You played actually in the ABL before the WNBA actually existed and you've played till 2012. What experiences have you taken from the WNBA that has assisted you in your life? Well, a lot of great experiences. It's been an awesome journey. Um, but also just who I am, the, the self-confidence, the self-esteem, all those things I learned even when I first started playing basketball many, many years ago. So um, for me, I think basketball has just taught me a grace and a poise and a calmness that I didn't have before. I was in such a rush for everything and nervous about everything and basketball just allowed me to sit in and sit back and, and watch things happen with minimal with minimal interaction but with maximum effort. You seem so relaxed and poised by the way, not to mention. <laughs> and you know the WNBA is in their 20th season right now. What changes have you seen from when you were playing till now? I think it's been a phenomenal growth uh, of just women's basketball and the talent level, the talent pool I think is much deeper than it was when I came into the WNBA, we merged from the ABL into the WNBA, so it was a split talent pool. So when the ABL folded, now you have this big mix of what is considered the best of women's basketball. So back then, it was what they like to say, it was the golden age. Teresa Edwards was still playing. Teresa Weatherspoon was still <laughs> yeah. playing. Katrina McLean was still playing at that time. Rebecca Lobo, Lisa Leslie, Cheryl Swoops, oh, Cynthia Coopers. All of the people we now consider pioneers or legends were in their prime. They'd been overseas, they'd been in the ABL, and now those young ladies who are watching these players are coming into their own Candace Parker. Mm -hmm. Diana Taurasi was watching them at that time as well. Great. So you have all this great talent who watched great talent, mm -hmm. who had the opportunity to see these women, their idols on TV, doing what they loved at a high level, now becoming the guardians or the flag bearers of this movement of women's basketball. So it's just been on, you know, you have your, your curves and your classes, like um, we're on this side of the curve, they fix it so you can have good grades. Well, with women's basketball, you don't need that because it's always been an upward curve and the talent is just getting better. Brittany Griner came out at 14, she was dunking, she's 6'8". You know, you're just like, wow, can it get any better? And someone's recently told me about a 12-year-old girl that's dunking now. Yeah. So it's just becoming like, wow, what's next? So I just sit back as someone who played against these greats and I just say, wow, I mean, I'm in awe. And you mentioned that a lot of a lot of these young girls, like Brittany Griner, the, Tina, the Tinas, and the Skylar Diggins, mm -hmm. they looked up to phenomenal women mm -hmm. as yourself. Who did you look up to when you were coming into the sport of women's basketball? Because you, the, the league did not exist at right. that time. So who was your role model? Who was your mentor? And who was someone that you said, you know what? This is someone I want to follow in their footsteps. Well, for me originally, um, I'm much older than most people. So um, on TV at the era that I was a youngster, yeah. um, was only men's sports at the time. The NBA was in its infancy still. Um, and so I had the Philadelphia 76ers. Once I grew to an age of understanding who I was, Coach Ann Donovan was one of the people who has always impressed upon watching her, not only game, but the way she carried herself yeah. off the basketball court, which was important to me. I remember her in the Olympics. And then watching her as my coach in the ABL, understanding that I could be tall, graceful, and still fierce and still dominate in a sport that was really male dominated. Well, it's hard to accept when we were younger, as Coach Donovan will say, hard to accept being that tall. But when you carry yourself as she has with the honor and the grace of who she is and how she was raised, and then you couple that with a fierce determination and competitor okay. spirit, you have this role model that not only myself, but other young women can look and say, okay, I can do this. Like, I was dressed as a boy growing up because my dad didn't understand. So when I recognized Coach Donovan as someone who I was like, she's tall like me oh my god she plays basketball and she's a post and she wears wow. heels and she wears heels <laughs> and I can do this yeah. I and it really took me a long time to come into that being but having someone there who can at least show you that here's a way that's easier yeah. 
I had bumps too, but it gets easier as you go through, really helped me and it helped set the stage for who I am and what I wanna do and how I wanna help other young, not only basketball players, but young women who also may have that scene because everyone taught doesn't play basketball, mm -hmm. but they still wanna carry themselves in, in a way that shows that they respect themselves and they're happy about being tall and beautiful because I think all tall women are beautiful. I think all wow. women are beautiful of all shapes and sizes. And there's something magnificent about accepting as a young girl. Walking with your chest yes, high, appreciating, that you are, yes. Yes, that Thank you, you are that person. And you deserve that respect and that level of self-esteem. Yes. And you know, like you said, not all tall women play basketball, yes. you know, but they do have to find what they fit into. Mm -hmm. And even though you named all these positives, which were amazing positive that, that definitely helped you, I know you had some great challenges mm -hmm. entering, whether entering the WNBA mm -hmm. or while you were in the WNBA and not only in the WNBA playing professionally abroad as mm -hmm. well what were some of those challenges that definitely you know you felt like was something that was traumatic in your life well I think the the really hard part for me was loving myself mm -hmm. and understanding that I had a voice in this world um, as a child I didn't have a great childhood everyone always looks at the end product and think oh she had it easy but you go through so much and everyone's story is different but my story was really tough growing up, very tough childhood. So when I became, in, I guess, aware, self-aware, it wasn't a great self-esteem. I didn't have great confidence in myself. I wasn't happy being me. And for me, that challenge was understanding that basketball allowed me to have that voice and embracing it and accepting that what I said had meaning and value to others and knowing that what I said had meaning and value to myself as well. Um, and so my challenge with playing and being in, in Europe and, and basketball was accepting who I was and that this is a God-given talent that I had. Yeah. And as I moved into being a professional athlete, all basketball, my family was super important. I had a, a, a child at a young age, single parent. So going overseas, can I say, I want to be a great basketball player and only spend 20 minutes at work, working yeah. on that? Or can I say, I'm going to be a great wife and mother and spend 10 minutes working at that? You, you can't, it's like what they say in the Bible, you can't have two masters. Mm -hmm. I didn't want two masters. I only have one God, but I wanted to give equal due to the two things that I believe were gifted to me by God. My family, super important to me, but I also didn't want to neglect what I considered my work, mm -hmm. which was basketball. These are challenges, these are sacrifices, and I know you're very familiar with um, what's going on right now when it comes to salary equality, mm -hmm. when it comes to mm -hmm. women in sports. Mm -hmm. And these major sacrifices that a lot of women are making is not worth the money that they're getting, mm -hmm. the salaries that they're getting, mm -hmm. per se. You know, how do you feel about salary equality and how it's been affecting the WNBA in particular, mm -hmm. as well as other sports? Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a real hot topic. I know the Trump and Clinton debate is a hot topic, but for women in sports, this I is think hotter. it's hotter for us. Table this is hot. a table hot. <laughs> the six foot deep hot conversation. I deep. think for us, it's really important to recognize that. And I, I think I tell people this all the time. The NBA took quite a number of years to be what we see today with the million dollar salaries. And they've been at it so much longer. Um, for us and the NFL and the MLB, all, for us, we're still in our infancy, even though it's been 20 great years. I look at each and every aspect of the whole issue, not just women's basketball or women's soccer, but just women's professional sports in general. The marketing. Right, and... which hasn't had a great foothold in America. No, you go abroad and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. When you're here, it's kind of like a back burner, even with the WNBA and the ESPN deal that we have. Only like a couple of games right. on ESPN that are allowed. games out of 134, I believe, which has been in the newspaper forever since people got wind of it. Women's college NCAA basketball actually gets more publicity mm -hmm. than the WNBA. Mm -hmm. And a lot of women in college, high D1 or D2, or you know, they aspire to play WNBA. Mm -hmm. But when you get to the WNBA, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a whole nother world because there's a lot of politics involved now. So now you're not just playing for your school, you know, you're playing for a check, mm -hmm. you're paying to stay on the team, mm -hmm. you know, sure. so it's a lot of sacrifice and for 
for the marketing to be where it is now, it's, it's I personally feel it's unacceptable. Right, it's not sexy. <laughs> Yeah, we are, because we're women, we're beautiful. <laughs> but it's also buys into the notion of um, Agent Zero's crazy thing about let's put them in bras and little panties and then I'll come and see them play, somehow demeaning that the game of basketball is not enough, mm -hmm. where it is. But the marketing efforts that we have, yeah. unless you're a die-hard basketball fan and yeah. you're a guy, we don't even have men's sizes in our when we sell the jerseys yeah that's an issue Good point. I love my husband I don't want him in a women's cut jersey <laughs> I mean we bought them because he loves the WNBA yeah. but I think he would love it even if I wasn't part of it because he's that type of progressive man but you're not talking about one person you're talking about the amount that we need in order for our salaries to be competitive is a huge amount of the population that is not addressed in our marketing scheme. Even at my age, I'm thinking, what about my children's children? Mm -hmm. I want the WNBA to be around. How can I support it and make it marketable and make it viable for another 20 years? Yeah. I'd like to be sitting in my wheelchair with my fake teeth and my ice <laughs> sweet tea, sitting back and just watching it on the little screen on my eyes because by then they won't have TVs anymore. I'm gonna press the little button on the side and watch, watch the game while I'm rocking there, drinking my... I want to do that. Sweet tea. <laughs> Sweet tea is amazing. You got to have it in Georgia or Carolina, you know. Um, but how can I make that a viable reality mm -hmm. for the young girl who right now is just learning how to dribble? Mm. The young boy who maybe is not going to play in the WNBA, but his girlfriend or his wife or his daughter may. Now you're the head coach of mm -hmm. Post University, so you're actually aiding and helping them develop at a young age. How, how is the transition from going <laughs> from being on the court to actually being on the sideline as a head coach? When I make the transition, I'll let you know. <laughs> it's really difficult to, uh, you have so much knowledge running around in your head and you never think about it when your parents tell you things and you're just like, whatever mom, whatever dad. How to get that information out yeah. without sounding condescending or like a know-it-all or, or talking down. Because I have been there and done that, but I want to give it out in a way that they understand that it's to their betterment. That's why I coach, is to get that idea where at some point you have that aha moment. And you say, five years later you go, oh my God, I remember what Coach Dodge was talking about. Five years in. <laughs> yes, or 10 years yeah. where you may have been like, I hate her. Oh. And then I'm never gonna talk to her again. And then that moment you go, oh my God. And you pick up the phone and you say, coach, I I've had that moment. <laughs> That's what we live for I as never, coaches. I had that moment of not necessarily understanding in the moment, but definitely understanding a couple of years after. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing that you can tell these young ladies that are aspiring to be whatever they want to be, not just athletes, mm -hmm. and any and any of these young women and men, just anybody that needs the guidance, what would you tell them? I think the main thing for me is that passion. It's what drives you. It picks you up when you're depressed, when you're angry, even when you're ha happy, you're sad, you don't understand, you're confused, you're in between. That passion that you draw from whatever it is you do, you can go every day and be an accountant, work in bookkeeping, love numbers. You're passionate about that, it drives you every day. Whatever your passion is, that you stick with that and you let it work and ride you through to whatever your life work is supposed to be. And you don't have to be, aspire to be LeBron James. Mm -hmm. You don't have to aspire to be Taj McWilliams Franklin, but just aspire to be the best you you possibly can be. And I think that's what kids need to know and understand. Love who you are, follow what you dream to follow, and work hard at that. And at the end of the day, that's all you can say is that I've given everything. That 100%, follow that, and it'll always lead you somewhere great. Well, Miss Miss Franklin, thank you so much. I have chills. I literally have chills right now. And thank you to all my viewers for watching. And don't forget to comment, rate, and subscribe as we have many more amazing interviews on the way.